Good morning. Good morning. Uh, would you bow with me in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the beautiful sun outside. And we're thankful for the sunshine in our hearts because Jesus lives there. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the salvation he gives. I thank you, Lord, for this building. And I thank you for the people who are the true church who are here this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would bless every word, every song, every thought. I pray that all of our thoughts would be captive to Jesus today. And our, our minds would not wander elsewhere because you are the important one. You are why we're here. We just pray that, Lord, we would offer you worship and that you would accept it. Please meet with us today. We love you, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody blessed today. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Please stand up and let's praise our God, worship him. <clears throat>
please greet each other in the Lord before you take your seat. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to this First Baptist Church. Is there any visitors here today? We just hope that you have a blessing here today this morning. As many as you know, uh, maybe you don't know, we got the new projector up here last week here, so you can kind of tell there's a difference, but uh, it, looks pretty, it looks pretty nice. Uh, me and Rob and Lori, we got the thing up there, and uh, while we were working on it, Rob was up there, and I goes, you know, Rob, this thing, this ladder's got a crack in it, you know. <laughs> And he goes, thanks, Rick. <laughs> but we got it up safely, and it looks awesome. So, um, yes, just want to go over just a few announcements here coming up here this week. Um, just kind of follow along here. Uh, sign up in the back foyer back there. There's many things to be signing up for, coffee and the children's church and art. Just be aware of that. If you can help in that, that would be great. Uh, two liter bottles, just be collecting them and just... Put them somewhere in your house, but Lori needs them. Maybe she needs them in her house, I don't know. No, not yet, but just be collecting them for now. And then uh, Wednesday night art, just be aware of that coming up here this week again. And then youth, uh, Larry, you want to say a little thing about your event coming up? Okay, sounds good. And then uh, also Thursday night, be prayers and prayer savers. Just be aware of that as well. And then a ladies' Bible study, um, Danella Russies. And then uh, annual ladies' Develop Park Conference coming up here at Autumn Ridge. So you ladies, just be aware of that. So this time, let's pray for the offering and the service here. And uh, one more thing here, just for our prayer. At the bottom here, we didn't do this last year, but we're going to kind of just to kind of keep church for our church budget and offerings that are kind of coming in because last year we just never really did that. But just kind of keeps you aware of where we're sitting during the year as far as offerings and stuff coming in just to kind of like have a heads up because I really don't, you know, say much about that. But just, you know, be looking at, at that, you know, just to the year, how we go and pray about it, you know, and tithing and whatnot there. So we just appreciate it. So this time let's pray. Dear Father, we just thank you for this time and just thank you for your love. We just pray for this time and just pray for John as uh, he brings the message to apply to our lives, Father. And also we just pray for this offering and to uh, be used your own glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and are dismissed. Okay, church, would you please open your Bibles to the book of Revelation? Revelation chapter 2. We'll be reading the Word of God starting with verse 8, Revelation chapter 2, starting with verse 8, all the way down to verse 11. To turn this on, PowerPoint on, okay, cool. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, this thing says the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, but so that you may be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. But be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Before I share with you the word of God, I would like to uh, just uh, mention the fact and basically say that I hope you... You noticed, I hope you realized, that we have two babies in the house. Amen? Amen. We have baby Matthew Fessenden, who I believe this is his third or fourth Sunday already with us. And then we have baby Aaron Rink for the first time with us this morning, right? Welcome. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> what a blessing. The Bible says that children are a blessing from the Lord. We continue to pray that both the Fassenden family and the Rank family will continue to grow and raise their children just like all of us desire the same thing for our children to be raised with the fear of the Lord, in the fear of the Lord. 
Amen. Well, uh, today we are continuing with the church of uh, Sardis, of Smyrna, excuse me, with the church of Smyrna. And with the help and the grace and the wisdom uh, and leading of the Holy Spirit, we are going to uh, uh, tackle part two of the message we started last Sunday about the church of Smyrna. And the title of the message is The Rich Poor Church. And I want to refresh your memory a little bit now for the next five or ten minutes about what we have studied already about the church of Smyrna. Very quickly, very briefly. Remember, please, that the church of Smyrna is one of the two churches out of the seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. The church of Smyrna is just one of these two out of the seven who does not receive any rebuke, any criticizing from the Lord. The church of Smyrna only receives praise and encouragement from the Lord. And I want to remind you, basically, we spent about half an hour last Sunday uh, on this one thing. The church of Smyrna faced, they faced many things. And one of the main things that I pointed to you last Sunday about this rich, poor church is that they faced tribulation. And since they face tribulations, who are we to think and, and to even imagine that we are not going to face tribulation? Remember, please, that we said last Sunday that Jesus, basically, in this letter and through this letter addressed to the church of Smyrna, Jesus is calling his followers, his disciples. He was calling his followers back then. And he's calling his followers right now in the 21st century to remain true to their calling. To be that salt and to be that light and to be that city that is placed on a hill. And as we remain true to our calling, the Lord reminded us last Sunday through the passage that I started preaching on that we should expect opposition. We should expect persecution. And we said that persecution and opposition takes many forms. It could be teasing by someone that you know. It could be name calling. You could be told that you lost your mind, that you are no fun anymore. Because all of a sudden you don't talk like you used to talk. You know, like you used to talk prior to knowing Christ. You don't think like you used to think. You don't do things like you used to do things before. Because now you are accountable to the Lord. And you want to please him in everything that you do. So my, the reminder for us this morning. This is old information obviously from last Sunday. But it's important as we are about to get into new information. The reminder is this. We have to keep in mind, church, that Jesus, that God never promises that his children are not going to face trials uh, and, and tribulation. In fact, the Bible, God, Jesus Christ himself, over and over and over again, black and white in God's word, we are told that we are to expect persecution. We are to expect opposition. We are to expect suffering for Christ's sake. I am reminded of that verse in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. Yes, Paul says to Timothy and to us, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. There is no sugar coating. There is no maybe. There is no perhaps. All who desire to remain true to their calling and to please God will suffer persecution. In the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 10 and 11, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus also said, Blessed are you. Blessed are you, or blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, Jesus said, when they revile and persecute you. 
Wait a minute, Lord. Blessed am I, they revile me and persecute me. Yes, Jesus said, blessed are you. Be happy. Be happy. Be thankful. Be excited. Blessed are you, he said, when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you. Now, here is the secret. For my sake, Jesus said. In the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 18, Jesus said, if the world hates you, hey, do you see this opposition from the world, Jesus says? Do you see, are you sensing some, some hate? Are you experiencing some hate? Can you see that? If you do, Jesus said, if the world hates you, you need to know that they hated me before they hated you. Okay? So my friends, for the child of God, the question is not, am I going to ever face persecution? No. For the child of God, the question is this, Lord, when persecution comes, and it will come, suffering will come. Now I'm, I'm pre-trib, just so we can clarify that. I am pre-trib, our church is pre-trib, and I wanna just briefly, those of you who may not know exactly what that means, I believe that the church, the real church of Jesus Christ, will not go through the tribulation that is mentioned in the book of Revelation through the great tribulation. I believe that Christ will rapture us before all that judgment will come upon the face of the earth. I believe that the Lord will come and take us home and then the, the judgments and, and that wrath of God will come upon those who will be left behind, who will not be found in Christ when we will meet Christ up in the air. I believe that. Now I have friends who are mid-trib. I have friends who are post-trib. That's okay, you know. We, can, we don't know anybody who can tell you. Let me tell you this. Anybody out there, I don't care who he is. I don't care how many degrees he has, how many PhDs he has in the Bible or scholar. Anybody who can tell you, this is a, who would dare to tell you that this is exactly how it's going to happen. I would stay away from that person. I mean, we can look in the Bible. We, with the measure that God had, of wisdom that God had given us, we can say we believe that this is what's going to happen. But boy, there are so many things that we have no idea. They are known only to God. Amen? Okay. So even though I am, I am pre-trib, and so is the church, we believe that the church will not go through the tribulation that's mentioned in the book of Revelation. Boy... I believe with all of my heart. And we are seeing that now, that the church of the living God will be and is persecuted and it's suffering for the Lord. Prayer out of school, you know, no more. No more, if you tell them that you have the Bible with you, I don't know, I don't want to assume what they will do, but I don't think that you'll be welcomed in the school in our days with reading the Bible. You know, that fear of the Lord that used to be in our nation is not there anymore. It is not there anymore. The things that we used to, to uphold as a nation as sacred, uh, as, as righteous, because they were given to us by the Lord. Uh, right, now, right now, there are people out there who are attacking the very foundation and the very Bible principles that our nation used to stand upon. That's persecution, my friends. That is persecution. It takes many forms and many shapes. So for the child of God, again, I'm saying this. And by the way, God is using these messages to prepare us. I'll be honest with you. This is what I'm doing this morning. Through this message and through these messages, God is preparing me and God is preparing you and God is preparing our church. It's one of my jobs it is one of my jobs as a minister of the gospel to preach the whole counsel of God and to prepare you and God preparing us for that persecution and suffering that will come. So for the child of God, the question is not, am I going to suffer? For the child of God, the question is not, am I going to face persecution? No. For the child of God, listen to this, the question is, Lord, Lord, how am I going to handle this? Lord, when that suffering, when that persecution, 
when that name calling, when that teasing, when I will be passed by promotions from work because I, uh, I'm not into compromising my beliefs, when that comes, Lord, how am I going to handle this? And by the way, you need to make up your mind now before that persecution comes. And I believe we need to be the men and the women that say this, God, when suffering comes, when persecution comes, Lord, prepare me. Lord, equip me. And by the way, you cannot be prepared enough when that comes. You cannot be equipped enough. Please understand that. But, the, but we have to be prepared. My people perish from a lack of knowledge. Lord, prepare me. Lord, equip me. Lord, my desire in this life, my priority number one. If somebody was to ask John Todor, John, why are, what are you here for? What are you here for on earth? Here is what my answer will be. I am here to know him and to make him known. This is why I'm here. To know him and to make him known. So then, this is, I made up my mind already. This is what I'm saying. God, when that persecution comes, when that suffering comes, Lord, prepare me. Lord, equip me. Because the desire of my heart is to please you. God, I want you to shine through everything that I say and do. My purpose on earth is to glorify your name. To bring glory and honor to your name. Even through persecution. Even through suffering. So right now we need to ask the Lord. Lord, prepare us. Lord, equip us. Lord, when that persecution comes, we want you to be proud. To be proud of us. Amen? Okay, so they face persecu persecution or tribulation. Remember the word tribulation in Greek means to be, it, 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 it's the image of grapes that, that are being crushed. Grapes that are being crushed. So tribulation, it means to be persecuted or to suffer to the point of being crushed. Okay, so they face persecution. And so are we. Number two, the church of Smyrna not only faced tribulation or persecution, church, but I want to tell you that the church of Smyrna, they faced poverty. They faced poverty. Notice, please, how Jesus tells them in verse 9, I know your works, comma, tribulation, comma. We talked about this. And what's the next word on the list? And poverty. And then in parenthesis, what does it say? But you are rich. This is why I named this church, I called this church. By the way, I didn't come up with this. Christ did. I just say what Christ says. But this is why I entitled in the bulletin the name of the message, The Rich Poor Church. They were poor physically, but spiritually, my friends. They were rich. They were strong. And they were powerful. I have a question for you. Why do you think the church of Smyrna faced poverty? Anybody, let that, let that brain think a little bit. Not that you, you, you think, you always think, but let's use a little bit our brain a little bit more this morning. Why do you think that the church of Smyrna faced poverty? I'll give you the answer to this. I know you know it. They faced poverty for the very same reason that they faced tribulation. Remember I told you last Sunday why they were facing tribulation? They are facing tribulation because instead of going to the temple of the emperor and walking in and taking that incense and burning it at the altar and say, Kaiser Curios, which means Caesar is Lord, they would walk in. They were forced to walk in many times. But instead of saying, Kaiser Curios, they were saying, what, my friends? Christos Curios. And that means Jesus Christ is Lord. They faced poverty for the same reason they faced tribulation. Because they will not participate in the worship of the emperor. Of the emperor. Okay? I've been looking through the book of Acts this week. I love the book of Acts. Uh, how, how the church started and what God did in the early church. And if you remember in the book of Acts chapter 5... There is that instance then where 
the apostles were preaching the God, they were preaching the gospel, and all of a sudden the, the authorities come and they put the apostles in prison. Do you remember that? The book of Acts, chapter 5? Let me read that so that you'll better understand what I'm talking about. I love that passage. Listen, please. Acts chapter 5, starting with verse 17. You don't have to turn there. You can write it down for the reference. I'm just going to go ahead and start reading it. Pay attention, please. Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. Now listen to this. And when the officers came and did not find them in prison, they returned and reported. And here is what they said. Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. And when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple, and they are teaching the people. Verse 26, Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they sent them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you? not to teach in his name and look you have filled jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us now listen to verse 20, 29 here is the meat acts chapter 5 but peter and the other apostles answered and said we ought to obey god rather than men amen my friends Boy, how powerful is the word of God. My friend, me and you, and this is serious stuff. This is serious stuff, church. Me and you, if you have not made up your mind yet, I hope you have already. If, you, if not, it's still not too late. God is still giving us grace right now. We need to make up your, our minds already who we are going to obey. Not just when things are good, but for the rest of our lives. You know, I've been thinking, I have this, you know, wedding, wedding ring, this wedding band on my, on my finger here. You know, look how beautiful it is. Look how shining it is. It's gorgeous. It's, it's not very expensive, obviously, if you take a closer look at it. It's simple, simple but beautiful. Gold is shining in the, in, in the light of that bulb. You know what? Before I was able to put this ring on my finger, the gold, the mineral that, is, that this ring is made out of, it had to go through a lot of filters. It had to go through a lot of molding. It had to go through a lot of, a lot of things to take those impurities out so that me and you would have a beautiful ring like this one on your finger and be proud. In, in wearing such a ring. My friends, this is what Christ does in the lives of his children. And persecution and suffering for the Lord is the tool, one of the tools that God uses in order to make us look and be more like Jesus Christ. Amen? The church of Smyrna faced poverty and if we want to remain true to our calling and remain faithful to our lord and master we ought to expect that as well don't be surprised if it comes okay by the way if you look in greek the greek word for poverty it means to have absolutely nothing 
to have absolutely nothing. Okay? Uh, uh, by the way, this, this letter that Christ sent to the church of Smyrna, you know, really does not fit well at all with the modern gospel of prosperity that is being preached today in the 21st century. Oh, come to Jesus. And when you come to Jesus, you are going to have everything that you want. Just name it and claim it. It is proof. It is a passage that reminds us that if you come to Jesus, don't expect to be a millionaire. Don't expect that you're going to be a millionaire. Now, please don't, don't get me wrong. I thank God for the believers who prosper. And I prosper and you prosper. And all of us who are here today, I think we can all say we are blessed by the Lord, aren't we? We are blessed by the Lord. We have food on the table. We have clothes on our back. We can pay our bills. We have cars that we can drive to get places. We, I am not against believers who prosper. And all of us too, up to a certain extent. But my point is this. Listen, please. If you come to Jesus Christ today, and I hope you will if you haven't done so yet. I hope if you give your heart to the Lord, you may not become rich. So you don't come to Jesus for what you are going to get out of that, out of coming to Jesus. You know, you turn your life to the Lord. You are willingly turning your life to the Lord because Jesus Christ willingly went to the cross and gave, your, gave his life for the forgiveness of your sins. Amen? But God demonstrated his love towards us. You know that verse? In that while we were still sinners, what happened, my friends? Christ died for us. My friends, I don't know exactly how things are going to evolve. Only God knows. But I am, I am aware of the fact, and I'm not making any predictions Stay away from anybody who says this is exactly how it's going to happen. This is exactly what's going to happen in September. That's exactly how it's going to happen in March. I, they are crooks as far as I'm concerned. Stay away from anybody who points exact dates as to when Christ is coming, as to when Christ is wrapping things up. We do not know. Not God has given us signs, and we have to be wise in looking at the Bible prophecies, and I believe in the Bible prophecies, and there are signs, and we need to be watchful, but stay away from anybody who just puts his finger on something and says, that's exactly how it's going to happen. I don't think so. I do not think so. So we do not know exactly how it will take place, how things are going to evolve, how things are exactly going to evolve, but I do know this. This is just my personal opinion. We may be the generation, our generation, my generation, may be the generation that will see, that will face, that might experience what the church of Smyrna experienced 2,000 years ago. For staying true to our calling, for not compromising our beliefs, we may face tribulation and we may face poverty for the cause of Christ and my prayer is every day Lord when that time comes if it does come in my lifetime prepare me and help me to be ready for that because I want to make you proud with my life amen there is something else that I want to briefly point out to you notice please in verse 8 by the way verse 8 in chapter 2 it's the, the first verse of the letter that Christ sends to the, church of, uh, to the church of Smyrna. Okay, let me go back to Revelation. I was still in the book of Acts. Okay, Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. It is what it says. And to the, church, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, This thing says the first and the last, who was dead... And came to life. Let's talk about this. By the way, notice please that this is the opening verse of the letter. And on purpose, I am choosing to talk about this 
towards the end of my sermon because I believe that now that we know the content of the letter, we are able to understand. My question was, Lord, why did you identify yourself in this way to the church of Smyrna? Now that we understand the content of the letter, we are, I believe that we are able to better understand what Christ meant when he said this thing says, the one who is the first and the last, the one who was dead and the one who came to life. So let's talk about this for a moment. What do you think that Jesus said when he said, I am the first and the last? It is what I believe that he meant. I believe that when he said first, I am the first, that refers to his pre-existence. And when he said last, I believe that he refers to the fact that he will go on and on and on and on forever. So in other things, in other way, other way of looking at this or of saying this, you know, when other things cease, Christ does not cease to exist. Okay? The idea is that Christ transcends time. Christ transcends space. Christ transcends creation. Notice please that he says that he was dead and he came to life. What does that mean? I think all, all of us know what that means. That means that he as a man, please keep in mind that Christ was both God 100% and man 100%. That means that he as a man, you know, in order for, for us to be redeemed, he went to the cross and he died. Notice please he was dead put in a grave, and the Bible says that on the third day, what happened, church? He rose from the grave, and we serve a risen Savior. Amen? Okay, so why is Christ introducing himself this way to the church of Smyrna? I'm the first and the last. I'm the one who was dead, and now I came to life. Why do you think? Now that we know the content. I believe he introduces himself this way to the church, because of their persecution, because of the tribulation, because of the tough time that they were going through. So let me give you my own words, what I am understanding that Christ is saying here to the church of Smyrna and to us. Basically, Christ, Christ is saying to them, hey guys, I know that life is difficult for you. I know that. I know that time is tough for you. I know that you are living in a difficult and harsh world i know that history is unkind to you but i just want you to know i just want you to know church that i was here before it started and i will be here after it's all over i transcend all of this and because you believe in me and because of your relationship with me christ says you will too amen Notice, please, another thing that I want you to see how the, this letter ends, verse 10 and 11. Be faithful until, until death, and I'll give you what? The crown of life. If you were to choose one word for this sentence, what word would you choose? Rewards. This is what I would choose. Rewards. Is it bad? Is it bad to think of rewards? As a Christian, even in the daily, daily life, is it bad to, to say, man, I'm, I'm working hard, I'm doing my best, I'm doing my homework as a student, I'm going to work every day, and I cannot wait for that paycheck to come so that I can enjoy what I have worked. Is it wrong? I don't think so. Don't let anybody tell you that it's wrong. In fact, one of the things that we are doing to our children, and you, some of you may not agree with me, and that's perfectly okay, you know, we all raise our children with the measure and wisdom that God has given us. But when I, I see the tendency in my children to not wanting to do that homework or to be a little lazy in their schoolwork or at home, I remind them of those rewards. I remind them that if they study hard and they go to school and they give their best, I tell them, look, dad and mom may not have money to send you to college. But if you work hard and do your best, you may be able to get a scholarship. You may be able to get a scholarship if you're good in sports, if you're good in math, if you work hard. Obviously, we, we may not be able to afford it, but if you do your best, God will honor that. 
and you may get that reward at the end of high school. It's nothing wrong with that church. And here is what Christ says in the second part here in verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And now listen to this. It is the best part. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. I have a question for you. Who are those overcomers? He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Obviously, this is a good thing, not to be hurt by the second death. Before we talk about the second death, who are the overcomers? I want to be part of this group. We'll let the Bible, we'll, we'll answer this question with the Bible. Who is the overcomer? 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. Listen, please. For, our, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that he that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. My friends, who are the overcomers? You tell me, it's, it's right there. The overcomers are those who believe that Christ is Lord. The overcomers are those who have trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. What is the second death, by the way? The first death, keep in mind, it's physical, but the second death is spiritual. And when you think of the second death, keep in mind that we don't believe in annihilation. There are some doctrines out there who believe that if you're not right with God, you will die the second death, but that's it. You will cease to exist. That's called annihilation. We don't believe that that's the second death. We believe that you don't cease to exist, even though you will not go to heaven. We believe in a literal heaven, and we believe in a literal hell. So you are either going to, uh, uh, to exist an eternity and be an eternity with God, or you are going to be an eternity with Satan. That's the bottom line. So the question for us this morning is, are you an overcomer? Are you an overcomer? Have you placed your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ and in his finished work? And by the way, don't tell me that you don't know. Because I believe that you do know. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 16. That the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. That we are, what church? The children of God. So in your heart, all of us know this morning. I'm either an overcomer or I'm not. I'm either on the winning side or I am not. You know that in your heart this morning. You know that. You know if you are on the winning team right now. And the point that I want to make here today is that if, if you know in your heart, if the Spirit is telling you this morning that you are not on the winning side, that you feel right now that you would be hurt by the second death if you don't do something about it. My point here today is why don't you get things done? Get things done. Get things done. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, Jesus said. Anyone who hears my voice and opens, I will come in. I will dine with him and he with me. Amen, my friends. Amen. Christ, my friends, came to give you life. First John chapter 2, verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. John 10.10 10 says, I am the good shepherd, Jesus said. The good shepherd does what? Gives his life for his own sheep. Amen? Amen? So here are the final three lessons that I would like you to take home with you as we say amen to this message. Lesson number one, those who follow Jesus faithfully should expect opposition and persecution. Lesson number two, Jesus comforts his suffering people. And lesson number three, the great Christian hope is not the removal from trouble, but our resurrection from the dead. Amen.
And because he lives, sing with me. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives let's sing this chorus again with all of our hearts and because he lives thank you lord i can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because i know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives amen what an honor this morning church after worshiping the lord after singing glory and honor to the lord through our songs after listening to the preaching of the word of god that reminded us about who christ is and who we are in the lord after we are reminded about his perfect life here on earth after we were reminded about his ultimate sacrifice on the cross and after we were reminded this morning about his triumphant resurrection what an honor today to be able to be partakers of the lord's supper isn't that a great thing this morning i want to read a few verses from the bible from the word of god for i received from the lord that which i also delivered to you that the lord jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take it this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me in the same manner he also took the cup after the supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes we know what we need to do we ought to examine ourselves i examine myself you examine yourself and if you are right with god if you've done your part of being trying your best to be right with others the lord is inviting you to the to the table this morning brother john brother john witzel would you please ask the lord's blessing upon the bread dear heavenly father i want to thank you for bringing us all here and i pray that you uh give us your honor and your glory and have this uh bread be a token of your life that uh, we can partake it and live through you in jesus name amen amen as the deacons will be passing the elements uh, we'll be singing uh, song number 336 we'll see how the verses go how it flows <laughs>
said, take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Brother Bob, would you please ask the Lord's blessing upon the cup? Father, we just thank you for this message we've heard today. We just thank you for what Christ did in the cross for us. And uh, we just are so blessed as yes. we remember this. Amen. Amen. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Thus do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's also drink remembering Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Church, would you please stand? I want to invite Brother Truman up here to lead us in the closing song and prayer. Go up there. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Dear Lord, we thank you for the privilege we have of being in your church today. We pray that the sermon will be taken to heart and help us to live out our, through the week with serving you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.